they will soon be in Ukraine. The Belarusians heat up their tank engines. Apart from this one. Although it may look threatening, it's actually reserved for tourists like us. In Belarus, journalists are not welcome. So to avoid being spotted, we pretended to be tourists to understand why this country has become a strategic ally of Russia. The nostalgia of the former USSR can be seen throughout the country, particularly the Stalin line, a bit like the Maginot line from the Second World War of the Soviet Empire. Yes, because uh, 20 soldiers, it was crew of this barca from 10, 10 days, they can leave, sleep and shoot from the enemy. Please, come inside. In order not to arouse suspicion, we film with our phones and small, inconspicuous cameras. However, if our guide doubts us even slightly, he's obliged to denounce us. This ammunition cannot shoot. Yes, very heavy. Yes, uh, time speed 12 shoots per minute. And uh, it was like this? Look, when you, if you want, fingers up. Outside, we witness a shooting session with live ammunition this time. Today, some extras are also rehearsing a battle. The image sends shivers down our spine, as at the same time, the sound of marching resounds from the border which separates Belarus and Ukraine. Over there, it's no longer a mere rehearsal. President Lukashenko and Vladimir Putin have reached a decision. In three days, the 30,000 men of the Russian army stationed in Belarus will invade Ukraine. We have infiltrated one of the most secret and isolated countries in the world at the worst time. We began rather relaxed, but our smiles from those first days quickly gave way to anxiety. Our trip did not go as planned. Belarus is very often labeled as the last dictatorship in Europe. Its president, the almighty Alexander Lukashenko, is determined to defy the world. In his country, international law does not exist. To arrest an opponent, he hijacks an airliner. Europe imposes sanctions on him. He punishes them by sending hundreds of thousands of refugees to its borders. Reflex un peu de cours de récréation, eh bien, ils m'ont fait des ennuis, je vais leur faire des ennuis. Volen na vlast. Vot eto samy strashny diagnoz dla politika. Demonstrators demand his resignation. Lukashenko orders his police to shoot them. And why is he not afraid of anyone? Because he has pledged his allegiance to the Russian Goliath. Vladimir Putin protects him. Ally and accomplice, the two men use the same methods. Today, like North Korea, this totalitarian state is completely close to the Western world. However, we managed to spend almost two weeks here, pretending to be tourists, in which we were able to meet his opponents who live on the edge. A permanent surveillance which oppresses the Belarusian youth and forces them to live in fear. We don't trust anyone these days. We don't trust anyone. Okay, okay, no problem. I mean, no not, problem. not policy talk. I don't know whether or not you're a fucking agent or something like that, you know? What? Many flee the country to avoid prison. Yesterday I received a letter with a um, threat uh, to be killed and to be cut off my head. 
Even four-year-old children are not safe from the barbarity of the KGB, the Belarusian secret police. They sent to every kindergarten a video and asked the uh, director just to, if they find this them kid, just to call. At a time when Vladimir Putin is doing everything in his power to get his hands on Ukraine, we will explore a world that we thought had disappeared, a frightening taste of what could await Ukraine in case of defeat. Bonjour, monsieur. Je vous en prie. Merci. For one year, Europe has forbidden all planes to land in Belarus. So the first stop of our trip is Istanbul. But why such a sanction? Well, President Alexander Lukashenko has hijacked a plane before, a case worthy of James Bond. In May 2021, he sent a jet fighter to intercept a Ryanair plane passing over Belarus. He hijacks it and forces it to land in Minsk. The official reason, there's a bomb on board. Once the plane landed, instead of the police searching for explosives, they arrest a passenger. The journalist Roman Protasevich, an opponent of the regime who had taken refuge abroad. After his arrest, as if by chance, on national television, he confesses to being a dangerous agitator. Lukashenko acts outside of international law. We are warned even before arriving in Belarus. We land in Minsk at the end of the day. The post-Soviet capital of two million inhabitants has all the qualities of a modern city. In order to remain as secret as possible, we book a guest room. Since the Ryanair affair, friendly greetings to Europeans are rare. The owner is very surprised to see French people. Perfect. Very beautiful. There is a lot of tourists in Minsk uh, these days. Now it's not a lot of tourists because it's very difficult to come here. Sure. And I need your passport because uh, make a registration. Do you need a picture? Yes, yes. No problem. As in any police state, the owner is obliged to pass on our passports so that they can be checked. Uh -huh, it's nice. Do you have um, internet here? Yes, yes, I do. Is there, the, the, is there a limitation of... Uh, no, 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 no. No. Like in France? <laughs> the two rooms? We are surprised. The internet is free, but it's impossible to know if the network is monitored. Yes, yes, we are wary of it. Yeah, hot water. There's something hot that water, I'm... Yes. <laughs> The next morning, we leave to explore Minsk. The best way to evaluate the purchasing power of a Belarusian is to go shopping. Even if the cost of living is almost three times lower than in France, most people avoid entering supermarkets like this one. In the capital, the average salary does not exceed 450 euros. And in the countryside, it's limited to 200 euros. The supermarket has been designed for the upper middle classes. Like those who work in the country's growth sectors, farms, oil refineries, and fertilizers. But there is a question on our minds. As a foreign tourist, can we walk in the streets of the capital without being followed by a plain-clothed policeman, as in the times of the former USSR? We made an appointment with a local guide. In order to pass unnoticed, we will film everything with our phones like real tourists. So Minsk is a really old city, like old lady, but looking like young, 
young woman. <laughs> but of course, the, uh, the answer why it's, it looks so modern, uh, that it was de devastated till ashes so many times and burned 17 times, can you imagine? There are still some grand Orthodox churches and especially vestiges of its Soviet past. As with this monument erected to the glory of the comrades, or this one dedicated to the soldiers of the Red Army fallen on the battlefield at the time of the Siklan Hammer. From here to uh, memorize, uh, to commemorate uh, our guys who were participants of Afghanistan war. Okay. We uh, came to Afghanistan from the side of Soviet Union, and actually it was in 1979. While walking, we looked discreetly around us. But in our two-hour visit, there is no sign of surveillance or forced order. We only see one soldier and one police car. We tell the guide about our realization, but her answer quickly brings us back to reality. You will not see like lots of uh, people, lots of soldiers, but they are everywhere. I mean, it's normal not to have them, but it's so peaceful in the city because there were years when they took people and the uh, rules are very strict. Now people, they just don't make any troubles in the city center because they know that uh, they, will be, they will be in trouble. And we were imagining uh, cops everywhere and stuff. Uh -huh. But you no. will not see, you will not see. No. But they are here. But they are here. For our guide, it's a good marketing strategy. Belarus has become the ideal place to spend safe vacations. I love to do different stuff. For now, Belarus is really safe. I mean, in terms of visiting, if you are a foreigner, if you are a tourist, if you want to come, uh, there are no restrictions, there is nothing, you can know, go everywhere, everything, everything looks very normal. But not completely. The actions of its president, who constantly flouts human rights, doesn't provide much reassurance. I have two reservations for March. People are afraid to come here, there are also restrictions to come. If the political situation changed, maybe the tourists uh... Welcome back. Her low register says a lot about the terror that Alexander Lukashenko has on the whole country. So who is this man that some describe as the last European dictator? Alexander Lukashenko was born in 1954 in what was then the Socialist Republic of Belarus. He grew up in a peasant family, but the man was ambitious. After the army, he quickly climbed the ladder. The party entrusted him with the management of a state farm and then the reins of a building materials factory. His life changes in 1989. The USSR collapses with the Berlin Wall, but he takes flight. He was elected deputy of the young Belarusian Republic at 37 years old. We meet a man who knew him closely. Anatoly Libetko was close to the president before becoming a pariah in his eyes. However, he was part of the first circle of friends of the president in the early 90s. In 1991, after the fall of the Socialist Republic, Belarusians discovered what life was like to be without restrictions, a life of freedom with abundant supermarkets. The young deputy Lukashenko discovered his talent for speaking in public. 
И людям впервые за долгие годы позволили говорить, говорить открыто. Лукашенко, он был далеко не самый э, популярный и умный депутат, но он был одним из самых активных. Он выступал от микрофона буквально по всем вопросам. И ему еще повезло, он э, стал главой, э, главой группы по борьбе с коррупцией. И это был тот трамплин, который очень сильно способствовал популярности и известности Лукашенко. A strategy that paid off. In 1994, although he was not the most loved, Alexander Lukashenko became the first Belarusian president. In Belarus, Lukashenko was elected with 80% of the votes. He quickly showed his true colors. Потом уже узнали, что, оказывается, Лукашенко э, избивал своих рабочих. Самая большая неожиданность для всех – это было то, что Лукашенко болен. Болен на власть. Вот это самый страшный диагноз для политика. Президент Лукашенко решил все сам. Лукашенко пошел на уничтожение всего, что называется альтернативой. In 1996, in order to extend his mandate from five to seven years, Alexander Lukashenko tries to modify the constitution. 89 out of 110 deputies are strongly opposed to it. The sanction is severe. He adjourns the parliament and sends the rebels to detention. Even his old friends like Anatoly Lebetko who dare to rebel, suffer the same fate as the others in a prison that looked like this one. Да, это очень похожая камера. Например, в моей не было туалета. Вместо него был бачок. И туда нужду можно было справлять. В камерах вонь, и для того, чтобы уменьшить эти запахи, мы просто бросали в этот бачок кожуру от мандарин. Анатолий Лебетко drew the horror of his detention cell. Here, the guards who dressed entirely in black and who tried to break him day after day. Неизвестность это действительно испытания. С тобой могут сделать все, что угодно. Ты как вещь, как собственность. Каждый день тебе выгоняют в подвал, в холодное помещение, раздевают до гола, и ты должен стоять 30-40 минут, не двигаясь в таком положении. Конечно, это пытки. Я не получал писем от родных. И когда я получил первое письмо, это было даже скорее маленькая записка, где рукой моего сына было написано «Папа, у нас все хорошо». И тогда я впервые отвернулся к стене, и я заплакал. The president's disgraced friend spent 108 days in prison. Когда я сидел в тюрьме, нас были десятки, сейчас тысячи. И это ужасно. Between 1994 and 2020, Alexander Lukashenko was re-elected six times with over 80% of the votes. None of these elections were validated by the international community. А вот в 2020 году у него не стало ни международной легитимности, ни легитимности внутри страны. И поэтому практически все это время он провел в военных казармах, на полигонах, с военными, с генералами. Он понял, что только с их помощью он может оставить за собой власть. 
For 30 years, Lukashenko has been consolidating his power at the expense of his people, whose freedoms are constantly decreasing. The youth is the first to suffer. In Minsk at nightfall, young people meet in the bars that animate the streets of the historical center. We go to one of the most famous, known for its live concerts. Local bands play rock classics. A place to party like in any other country according to the bouncer. Everything seems normal until we start the conversation. Do, do you have a lighter? Mistrust reigns. Traveling, holidays. Yes? Yes? Yes, sure. Sorry, what? Are you fucking out of your mind? You got here in Belarus, the most fucking unsafe country right now in the world. Do you even know what, what's going on here? No, maybe no. Really? No. You won't, don't want to tell me. No. I don't know you. I don't know whether or not you're a fucking agent or something like that, you know? What? Agent? These people are just going to jail here right now for saying the word. Okay, okay, no problem. No, no, no policy talks. No, 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 no. Just chilling. Just chilling. These young Belarusians belong for the most part to the educated middle class, which has emerged in recent years in the country. They are the ones who are particularly targeted by the government. And what are you doing here? Uh, and they hate us. They're trying to make a lot of taxes for us, so they look like we are the enemy of government. We're thinking too much, we too much clever. When you meet people uh, that you don't know, for example, in the work and stuff, are you afraid of uh, talking about that? We cannot uh, talk about politics in the street, for example, uh, of stuff. You can. You can, maybe, but... <laughs> but you don't want to. <laughs> Please don't try it. <laughs> no. 20% of people, they can be yeah. something like cops, mm -hmm. or tied up to cops. And my idea is I wanted to share that uh, the government, like in North Korea, yeah, they imagine the situation to... to kind of create a North Korea in our country, but more than 80% of all the Russians are not. They are educated European uh, free people. Yes. And that's the reason uh, why you are comfortable with us. Let's drink like never before, <laughs> <laughs> like, like it will be the last time. <laughs> Have the time to meet some people. Belarus is the only country of the former USSR to have kept the name KGB to refer to its secret police. And it has lost nothing of its formidable efficiency. The KGB arrests and imprisons without needing any justification. We are expected one hour from the capital in one of the big cities located in the west of the country. In order not to attract attention, the person we are going to meet has formally forbidden us to speak French and English on the street. On the 25th of June 2020, Daria's husband was arrested by the KGB. Сначала я не пустила их в квартиру. На мои слова они ответили, что если я не впущу их, то они будут взрывать дверь при полуторагодовалом ребенке. Igor, her husband, a freelance journalist, ran a news channel on the internet. His articles were not openly critical of the government but after a sham trial, he was sentenced to 15 years in prison for disturbing the peace. 
Вот здесь, на этом стуле, лежат его шорты. Они здесь находятся с 25 июня 2020 года. Я не могу их убрать. After her husband's arrest, Daria resigned from her job as a civil servant. It was impossible for her to continue working for the state that separated her three-year-old daughter from her father. Yeah. Uh, she helps me. Я никогда не была сторонницей действующей власти, но так открыто об этом я не говорила. То есть, uh, забрав моего супруга, можно сказать так, они меня просто радикализировали. Когда я объявила голодовку вместе с мужем, мне поступила информация, что мою дочь могут забрать. Безусловно, волнение за дочь присутствует, но со своей стороны на данный момент я сделала все, чтобы в случае, например, моего задержания она оказалась в безопасности. Whenever she can, on social networks, Daria criticizes the state, but she tries never to cross the line. Интернет в Беларуси он под контролем. Я стараюсь говорить все, как оно есть, но делаю это так, чтобы не нарваться на уголовную статью, так скажем, красиво, но не так, чтобы вызвать агрессию с их стороны. As a dissident, Daria is entitled to special treatment. Если в моей квартире жучки, там видео, либо звукозаписывающее устройство, я не могу сказать. Uh, бытует такое мнение, что они могут ставить прослушки uh, в лампочке либо в светильнике. Uh, но я знаю сто процентов, что в моей машине есть прослушка, и я даже постараюсь показать то место, где она находится. Uh, я ставила машину uh, на парковке, uh, вернулась, а кнопочка была вот так. Она так никогда не делала. Соответственно, как бы здесь все предельно ясно. So Daria asks us to be quiet. Only our translator is allowed to ask questions in Russian. How did this influence you? In Jodin, on the final accusations, he committed suicide, and the therapist, without thinking, said that the veins are not like this, but like this, if you want to be with the ends. So, this is a therapist. I strongly wish a psychologist to get a diploma or to put the table under the table that is badly standing. Daria goes to visit her husband twice a week, but the couple is forbidden to touch each other. С моей стороны стекло, с его стороны стекло, и между ними решетка. И все это через телефонную трубку, только если как-то обнять его, либо взять за руку, я не могу. Свидание длится два часа, ты все это время говоришь по телефону с ним. Все это, конечно же, записывается. В моем случае это подавно, потому что меня всегда садят в одну и ту же кабинку, видимо, с хорошей прослушкой, пишущей прослушкой. Despite the risks, Daria agreed to speak openly. She doesn't want to hide anymore. Страх они убили во мне путем давления на моего мужа, давления на мою семью. Чем больше они хотят хуже сделать для меня, тем больнее для них я буду отвечать. We won't go with her to prison. The risk of being arrested is too high. For the past few years. People like Daria have dared to speak out and challenge the absolute power of their president. And sometimes it ends in a bloodbath. Today in Belarus, it's forbidden to dress in red and white. The colors of the former flag of the country became the rallying sign of opponents. In the summer of 2020, during the last presidential election, Alexander Lukashenko was faced with a problem. This lady here. Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. She entered the presidential race the day her husband, a famous opponent, was imprisoned. The English teacher knew how to wake up her people who didn't dare to rebel. She made them realize that the infinite power of Alexander Lukashenko was not indestructible. Но сейчас то самое время, когда каждый должен переступить свой страх. Вы думаете, мне не страшно? Друзья, мне страшно каждый день. Но я встаю, 
Я собираю свою волю в кулак. Я переступаю свой страх и иду, к ва... иду дальше. Иду на встречу победе. But unsurprisingly, Alexander Lukashenko won votes that would make anyone nostalgic of the Soviet era envious. 80% of the votes. Immediately, the authoritarian president warns those who wish to contest this result. Except that this time, his people do not conform and instead rebel. Hundreds of thousands of people take to the streets with the slogan. As promised, his response is fatal. The president gives the order to shoot the crowd. A dozen deaths, hundreds of injuries, tens of thousands of arrests, and he was not finished there. During the following weeks, the KGB is peeled to social networks. No demonstrator can escape them. A video attracts their attention. It goes viral on the Belarusian web. This little four-year-old boy, also in red and white, has become one of the symbols of resistance. As such, the KGB started to pursue him. The story of this pursuit is hardly believable. For a year and a half, Victor and his mother have been hiding in Lithuania. It video was very um, virus video. Everywhere they put in Forbes and everywhere some people start to call me from America and said, are you crazy? You need to run away immediately. Why, why, why? I say, come on, it's a kid. Why? No, not so. No, nobody expects so big pressure on these things, you know. The Belarusian KGB knows that martyrs and symbols do much more harm than the best of speakers. To find Victor, the secret police launches a titanic program, sifting through all the schools of the capital and its suburbs. They sent to every kindergarten a video and ask the uh, director just to, if they find this them kid, just to call. And uh, the director called me and said, oh, come to our kindergarten. I say, oh, it's still warm, we are outside of the city, soon we come. But my friend, she's understood because she saw it and she recognized him and she called me and she said, mm, don't go to kindergarten. Irina fled, leaving everything behind. She had to abandon her business, her family, and particularly her husband, a demonstrator. He was imprisoned a few days before the video of his son. Today, he has been in prison for a year and a half for simply wanting to express his discontent. The whole of Europe condemns this savage repression. President Lukashenko is weakened, but he still receives strong support, that of their Russian big brother. According to Jean de Glignasty, former diplomat, specialist in Eastern countries, between the two men, their relationship is one of love and hate. Vladimir Putin would like to replace him, but he has no choice but to support him. Les Russes veulent changer Lukashenko. Ils ne sont pas contents de ce dirigeant qui les a menés un peu par le bout du nez, qui leur a extorqué des tas d'avantages économiques, avec qui il est difficile de parler. Donc ils veulent le changer, mais ils savent que euh, le changer en ce moment, ça serait difficile. Et puis ça risquerait aussi d'ouvrir les vannes à une contestation et l'apparition de dirigeants beaucoup plus pro-occidentaux. Donc en période de, de guerre avec l'Ukraine, de, de nouveaux rideaux de faire avec les sanctions, euh, je pense qu'il il va rester encore en place euh, euh, assez longtemps. The unlimited violence used to repress demonstrations and the hijacking of the Ryanair plane have led Europe to tighten the sanctions against Belarus. 
but they are far from destabilizing the country. Jean de Glignasty explains that with Alexander Lukashenko, it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Et donc à ce moment-là, Lukashenko, typique du, du, du dirigeant, euh, euh, réflexe un peu de cours de récréation, eh bien ils m'ont fait des ennuis, je vais leur faire des ennuis. Donc ils ont attiré, dans la perspective de s'installer en Europe, attiré littéralement un certain nombre de migrants syriens et du Moyen-Orient. Et une fois qu'ils étaient en, en, en Biélorussie, on les a envoyés à la frontière polonaise et à la frontière lituanienne. The Belarusian authorities charter several planes to Iraq. They come back loaded with thousands of migrants to whom they promised fast access to Europe. Only... Legal border crossing is forbidden. You will face criminal charges. But it's too late. The trap has closed. The Belarusian policemen prevent the migrants from turning back and force them to move forward with truncheons blocked in a no-man's land with temperatures approaching minus 30, some die of cold. A humanitarian crisis breaks out. Alexander Lukashenko accuses Europeans of mistreatment. C'est un geste de mauvaise humeur euh, euh, qui a marqué d'ailleurs la dureté du personnage parce que ces gens étaient affreusement maltraités. Mais euh, donc c'est une, une vengeance pure et simple. While the migrant crisis is in full swing, Vladimir Putin and the Belarusian president have an ice hockey match. The master of the Kremlin is playing in the same team as Alexander Lukashenko. This is a very clear message addressed to the whole world. Sanctioning Belarus is to attack Russia. Это два идеологических близнеца, два человека, которые больны на власть, и при этом они ненавидят друг друга. In exchange for this support, the Belarusian president lets Vladimir Putin install his army along the border with Ukraine. Officially, it's only a question of joint military maneuvers between the two countries. The international community is worried, and there is reason to be. Satellite images show that the Russian army occupies no less than five military fields and four air bases. they are also installing high-tech equipment, as shown in these images from the Russian Ministry of Defense with its impressive anti-aircraft batteries in place. The morning of February 24th, we're in Minsk and we discover at the same time as the rest of the world the announcement of war. Russian troops stationed in Belarus are invading Ukraine. We start to feel a little tense. France strongly condemns the attack and we're surely the last French tourists in the country now. We fear that the KGB will start to dig into our backgrounds and discover that we are journalists. Today we have a meeting with an opponent, but when we call her bad news, she refuses to meet us. Donc c'est annulé. Je pense qu'elle a eu trop peur aujourd'hui. Ouais, je crois que le déclenchement de la guerre en Ukraine a complètement euh, bouleversé parce qu'elle est du pays. Donc annulation. The opponent advised us to change our accommodation quickly. She fears for our safety. A few hours later, 
we arrived in a new guest house at the other end of the city. However, we don't feel calm. We do a quick inspection just to make sure ears are not hidden in the walls. We look around the street. It seems we were not followed. But it's impossible to be sure. Our biggest fear is to be arrested for espionage. And as we feared, our trip in Belarus will end badly. Vladimir Putin did not choose to invade Ukraine on February the 24th by chance. It marks the holiday of the defender of the fatherland. This holiday, which dates back to the former USSR, is celebrated throughout Belarus with parades and reenactments of battles like this one. We are shocked that the festivities have not been cancelled, while on the other side of the border, men are killing each other. Here, extras reenact war. Among the spectators, there are many nostalgic for the father of peoples and the lost splendor of the Soviet Union. So, of course, Putin supporters are present in large numbers, and for them, this war with Ukraine is well justified. Many Belarusians watch only Russian TV channels, and this is evident from the speech of this extra, a carbon copy of Putin. But in Belarus, not everyone is pro-Russian, nor pro-war, quite the contrary. This is what this taxi driver explains to us as we film discreetly. The man would never have spoken openly. The dome of terror that covers the country is having its effect. The fear of prison silence is part of the population. The few brave ones who dare are quickly dealt with by plain clothes policemen, as in this video. Fleeing the country is the only way to criticize the government without risking ending up in a prison cell. Political opposition go into exile in the neighboring country of Lithuania. Its capital, Vilnius, is only 170 kilometers from Minsk. Today, it hosts a large part of anti-Lukashenko demonstrators, starting with Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, who took refuge here a year ago. The English teacher who had the courage to confront the tyrant president during the presidential elections of 2020. Not surprisingly, she lost because of rigged elections. Today, she demands the presidency. Threatened with death, she went into exile here with a close bodyguard. For her, the danger is real. So before meeting Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, we must show our credentials. After the search, we are confined in a room, or rather in this safety lock. 
right? This is the broad border, yes. This is the border between the open part of our um, office and the closed part. Okay, so we don't go, part. We yes. don't go there you, Yes. Oh, yeah, I've... Anna Krasolina, the press officer, is not kidding. Threats are daily. Okay. Yesterday I I received a letter from, uh, I don't know from whom, maybe from KGB agent, uh, uh, with a um, threat uh, to be killed and to be cut off my head. Is this the first time you received that? No, a lot of... <laughs> and she has reason to take it very seriously. Last summer, Vitaly Chikov, another opponent, was found hanged in Kiev. The Ukrainian police suspect a murder disguised as suicide. His colleagues accused the Belarusian KGB. The president in exile finally shows herself. Like a head of state, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya has many meetings with European diplomats. Today, she met with the ambassadors of the Czech Republic and Spain. <laughs> uh, 15, 20 minutes. Svetlana Tikhanovskaya assures us that as soon as she recovers the presidential mandate, which is rightfully hers, she will quickly cut ties with Vladimir Putin. Lukashenko dragged uh, Belarus into this war against our brother Ukraine. We see that he uh, is losing our independence. And after the election election 2020, only thanks to Russian support, and now Lukashenko is paying uh, for this support, giving our, like, rent in our land for um, uh, Russian military forces. Lukashenko was always close with uh, Putin, of, and now, of course, he has the only ally, because uh, he, he knows that he doesn't have support from Belarusian people. So from Vilnius, Svetlana is trying to organize the resistance. We are trying to persuade our Belarus and soldiers not to participate in this war, not to fulfill criminal orders of uh, uh, Lukashenko. They have a possibility to stop um, uh, like railway transportation of uh, uh, military equipment, of food for, uh, for um, uh, Russian military troops. Uh, a lot of uh, people on the ground make pictures of uh, uh, tanks moving through our country and give this information to Ukrainian side. Svetlana Tikhanovskaya invites us to follow her. She is expected at the other end of the city, at the Russian embassy. Finally, in front of the embassy. She takes part in a meeting which denounces the war in Ukraine. Her bodyguards are not reassured. But for her, it's an important event against Vladimir Putin. This attack by Kremlin on Ukraine is an attack on liberty. And it's our duty to stand with Ukraine. In the face of such evil, all of us who believe in freedom, today we are all Ukrainians. Slava Ukraini. The battle will be long for the exiled head of state. Lukashenko is not ready to let go of the reins of the country. The autocrat never seems to run out of ideas. He's going to put a new referendum to the vote that will allow him to change the constitution in order to have even more power. He also added a little bonus for his friend Vladimir Putin, the authorization to deploy nuclear missiles on Belarusian soil. We return to Minsk. The day of the referendum, we film the small demonstrations that try to block some polling stations. State television threatens the demonstrators and broadcasts the arrests. The police arrested over 300 people, including myself. Fortunately, I had time to warn Emilie so that she could hide in another guest room and save the footage that we had shot for a week.
the police officers realize very quickly that I'm a journalist. They erase my footage from the day, and after eight hours of distressing custody, I am allowed to leave. Now we have no choice. We leave Belarus by bus. Our last moments of stress, crossing the Lithuanian border. The last 20 minutes seem never ending. But we managed to cross the last obstacle. Lituanie, à la frontière biélorusse, ça a pris un peu de temps, mon passeport a un peu coincé. Donc me voilà sorti. After the beginning of the war, the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs encouraged French people to leave Belarus immediately. Today, there are less than a thousand of them in the country.